Well, uh, it's coming to the end of the, the football season, tail end of the football season for some of us. And regardless of who you've been cheering for, I think what we all know is if, if you watch football, there's always going to be a winning team on the field. There's always going to be a losing team on the field. And the last few plays of the game, the losing team is going to do their best to get to the you know, 50 yard line and throw a Hail Mary pass. Everybody know what a Hail Mary pass is? Hail Mary pass is when the losing team, again, last few plays of the game, the quarterback drives the team to the 40 or 50 yard line and the quarterback hurls the ball as hard as he can into the end zone, hoping against hope that one of his teammates comes down with the ball in the end zone, either to tie the game or to, to, to win the game, right? And there's a lot of like really famous Hail Mary passes. I'm not including the one from a few weeks ago, Alabama, Auburn, 4th and 31. That's not really famous anywhere outside of our zip code. But there are really, really famous Hail Mary passes. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, 1984, Doug Flutie playing for then a really unknown Boston College. They're playing at Miami. And the last two minutes of the game, Miami goes up by a field goal. And Doug Flutie gets to the 50-yard line, hurls the ball into the end zone. Boston comes down with the ball. They win the game. It's like a Cinderella story. David and Goliath, everybody's cheering. Even if you don't care about Boston College, you're high-fiving people. You're like, that was incredible. Probably the most famous, though, of, of Hail Mary passes would be 1975, Roger Starbuck playing for the Cowboys, America's team. He's... They're playing against the Vikings. The Vikings are up 14-10, 24 seconds left on the clock. And Staubach is at the 50-yard line. And by the way, if, if you're wondering who invented the Hail Mary pass, it's Roger Staubach. He invented essentially when he was playing for the Naval Academy 10 years before that. And so he's at the 50-yard line, 24 seconds left on the clock, and he hurls the ball into the end zone. Drew Pearson, another Hall of Famer, comes down with the ball. Dallas wins, Dallas wins. Place goes crazy. At the end of the game, a reporter is interviewing Staubach and, and, and he's like, what, what was that? Like, what, what is that? And he's like, man, it was just a Hail Mary pass. <laughs> the next day, the Philadelphia Inquirer, on the front page, it, it read this way, Hail Mary pass blesses Dallas. <laughs> And so the Hail Mary pass, it, it's become the equivalent to the long shot, right? And, and long before the Hail Mary became vernacular within football, do you know where it came from? It came from the text that we're about to read, Luke chapter 1. If you've got a copy of the scripture, I'd love for you to turn there. If you're new to the Bible or new to church, welcome. Luke is in the New Testament. That's like the second half of the Bible. So you've got the Gospels, which are the eyewitness testimony of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're in the eyewitness testimony of the Gospel of Luke. And if you are here last week, you know this is where, where we were. Um, and just to kind of catch you up, where we've been is that the angel Gabriel has been dispatched by God and he's ending 400 years of silence, and he comes to first Zechariah and Elizabeth. These are the parents of John the Baptist. And now we find several months later, the angel is dispatched again, and now we find him in front of Mary and Joseph in the front end of this miracle of baby Jesus, the savior of the world. And this is where we're gonna pick up. Luke chapter one, verse 28. I'm gonna read this out of, just this little part out of the King James, so just settle in with me. It says, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Okay, so that's where we get the hail Mary from, right? And as I'm reading this, though, it, it, it's starting to really come together for me because I, I can't think of a longer long shot than the sovereign creator of the universe putting the savior of the world, the son of God inside of an unknown virgin teenager in a forgotten little village called Bethlehem. And yet it was a long shot. And that's the God that we're serving today, a long shot God, a God that does impossible 
things and yet always comes through. And so we're going to pick back up now in verse 26. I'm going to read out of the ESV translation in case you're wondering, just because we don't speak the Queen's English. Here's where we're going to pick up. Verse 26, it says this. In the sixth month, okay, so just, just a little reference. The sixth month is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. That's what we talked about last week. Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. And so this is now in contrast to she's pregnant for six months. And this is where we pick up. So the angels come in after six months. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So Gabriel had an earlier assignment with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now he's got a second assignment. He's now headed to Nazareth to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings. That's, that's the word hail in the King James. Greetings. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Now, this is a little bit different from Zechariah because Zechariah questioned Gabriel and Gabriel basically made him mute. Okay, and so Mary, she's not questioning Gabriel here. Clearly, you're going to see in a moment, her wondering was a, an amazement. She was like, I cannot believe that God even knows my name. I cannot believe that God has an assignment from me for heaven and her wonder ends up turning into worship. This is what we see, verse 30. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried down to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb, that's John the Baptist, leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Okay, so blessed and highly favored. That's the announcement over teenage Mary. Blessed and highly favored. So early in, in my Christian formation, some of you know I grew up in a, a non-religious Jewish family, got radically saved in high school, got rescued by Jesus, everything changed. But early in, in my church experience, I, I had, I'd never heard that phrase, blessed and highly favored. Um, but then I, I began to follow Jesus for, for years and got exposed, thankfully, to other streams in the Christian faith. And then I began to hear that. I'd be like, hey, how you doing? And somebody would say, I'm blessed and highly favored, which is 100% true. It's 100% true for you. It's 100% true for me. But what that may not mean, or at the very least, there's this little parentheses, it, it may not always include that you're going to be driving a brand new Mercedes. Yeah. Yeah. Blessed and highly favored does not mean that you're going to be excluded from sickness or cancer. It doesn't mean that, that every prayer that you pray is going to be answered the way that you think it 
it should be prayed. And so when somebody says, blessed and highly favored, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. You can be like, true. But blessed and highly favored also has this asterisk next to it that means trouble is often brewing. And what I mean is this, is Mary, in this context, more than likely she was 12 to 16 years old when the angel came to her. Okay, as a daddy's heart, I'm just going to say 16, okay, (laughs) because she's engaged to be married. She's got plans. She's got dreams. And the angel comes to her and interrupts all of her dreams, all of her plans, and she was planning. She was dreaming. Even a young girl, she's dreaming about her wedding. She is planning for her home. She is thinking and scheming and dreaming about children and a family for the next 50 years. And an angel comes in your house and he's like, hello, Mary, have you ever heard of Immaculate Conception? It's a miracle. And you get to be part of that. And it is amazing. But for Mary, she knew that was going to be an interruption. She knew trouble in some measure was coming. I mean, think about it this way. Mary's 16, angel comes to her, interrupts all of her dreams, all of her plans, and he's like, the son of God is gonna be put inside of your virgin womb. And then at 28, she's at the temple, she's visiting Jerusalem as every Jew would three or four times a year for the high holidays, presumably with Joseph and Jesus, and they lose Jesus in the city. Every parent is like, done that, been there, in the mall, lost our kid, and so they are frantically looking for 12-year-old Jesus in Jerusalem, and they finally double back, back to the temple, and they find Jesus at the temple, and he's like, hello, where did you think I was going to be? I'm going to be in my father's house. And they're like, okay, time out for you, Jesus. Spanking for you. I don't know. What do you do for baby Jesus or for 12-year-old Jesus? And so they're like, okay. I still don't think they had really comprehended what was going on. When Mary's in her 30s, I think she's really beginning to understand that God has come to the earth. Because the son of God has been being raised in their home. At 46, Mary is at a wedding of her dear friend in Cana, and they run out of wine. And Mary pulls back the curtain of the kingdom of God a little too early for Jesus' preference. And Mary looks to Jesus, and she's like, I know who you are. I've been living with you for 30 years, and I need you to fix this. At 49, Mary watches her son, the son of God, have nails puncture his hands and his feet, and he's crucified on a Roman cross. She watches her son die. At 49, she also watches him be put in a tomb. Also at 49, she watches watches him walk out of an empty tomb. At 49, she also has this conversation with him where he's like, hey, I'm about to leave. I'm returning back to heaven. I'm going to go take my rightful place to to sit at the right hand of the throne of my father. But I just want you to know, you've been amazing. And I know this has been a crazy life, but I just want you to know from 16 to 49, it has been a blessed and highly favored life for you. But make no mistake, the blessed and highly favored life of Mary did not mean it was free of trouble. It was not smooth. In fact, if anything, it started off with shock and awe. Because the angel comes in, in the middle of her dreams and the middle of her, her plans and interrupts that. And then what was shock and awe ends up being shame. Because Mary, as a testimony, is, is telling all of her friends, God did this. I didn't do this. I was faithful to my fiance. This is God. I don't understand it. I can't explain it. But this was God. And all of her friends probably were like, oh, sure, God, I'm sure that's what, what's happening. And then behind her back, they're like, she's crazy. She needs medication. Something's going on. And then it was surreal because 
a baby came and she was a virgin. And then it was silence and then it was suffering. And all of that was under the banner of blessed and highly favored. What I want to do for the next couple of minutes, I want, to, I want us to hold on to a couple of realities, a couple things that, that hold all of this together, big themes in Luke 1. The first theme that is undeniable, we talked a little bit about this last week, but it's the theme of waiting and how a, a gospel kind of waiting, it's designed to stir up faith. And, and what I mean is this, is... There is divine activity happening all around us, whether we have eyes to see it or not. God's working on our behalf, around us. He's working all over the place. And the divine activity is an invitation for human response, which is called faith, right? And the thing is, if we're not waiting for anything, then we don't need faith. That's, that's how it works. And if, if we had time, we could go with a mic and we'd say, what are you waiting for? All of us are waiting for something. I mean, even if you're here and you're not a Christian, you're still waiting for something. But for those of us that would say, Jesus is king of our life, we would say, yeah, I'm waiting for God to do what only he can do. I'm waiting for God to establish his purposes. I'm waiting for God to bring back that wayward child. I'm waiting for God to heal a body. I'm waiting for God to intervene. And, and it would be amazing if God like, did everything we wanted him to do. That would, that would be amazing. It would be amazing if God answered all of our prayers the way that we thought he was supposed to answer our prayers. But hello, God's ways are not our ways. And so we, we, are, we find ourselves in a position that God puts us in where we wait. And we have to wait. And it's the posture of gospel waiting in terms of there's an anticipation. It's not just waiting because we have to wait, like a waiting room where it's like, I'm angry and I'm frustrated. It's not, that's not the kind of waiting. It's a waiting with anticipation. When you and I are in that kind of waiting where there's an expectation that God's going to break in, what that does, inevitably, it stirs up deeper surrender. It stirs up a deeper kind of faith in us. And what faith will always do, this is how you know you're operating in faith, is because faith will always bring to remembrance for you ways that God has already been faithful to you. Because faith isn't always looking forward. Faith is tethering ourselves to God's faithfulness. He does come through. He has come through 10,000 other times. That's how I know I have confidence that he will come through again. And so he brings to remembrance. And I would imagine, again, if we had time, I would imagine most of you could lift up a, a an experience where God's come through for you, a moment of faithfulness. And what's amazing for me, I was sharing this with a, a, a friend of mine even a couple of weeks ago, that there are moments where, where there's this intersection of pain and loss, or there's a, a, a place where our life gets rocked or something goes south or something unexpected shifts and, and it's not what we wanted. And before we've even had a chance to verbalize a prayer, before we've even had a chance to complain to a friend, God just comes in and does it. And you're like, I didn't even pray about it. I didn't even do it. I didn't even respond yet. And God's like, but hello, I'm faithful. I'm a God that's constantly coming through on your behalf. And this is why these, these testimonies of faithfulness have actually got to be verbalized. There's this command for us to to solidify our salvation by testifying to his faithfulness. We do it not just for our own faith, but for the faith of other people. This is how God came through. This is what God did. This is how God's working in my life. And it stirs up faith and reminds us of his faithfulness. But this is, this is my favorite verse in, in this passage. And I love how Mary responds to this because the angel comes, interrupts her. And there is nothing that we hate more than being interrupted. There's no greater sin that, that can be uh, assaulted on us than the sin of inconvenience. And yet, listen to Mary's response to this. She says, I am the Lord's servant. I'm the Lord's servant. 
That's the prayer of faith, by the way. I mean, it's the, it's the prayer that most Sundays, didn't do it today, but most Sundays, I invite you to pray before we open the word. It's the prayer that says, God, I don't know what you're about to do. I don't know what you're gonna ask me to do. I don't know what radical obedience you're calling me into, but before I ever hear it, I'm gonna say yes to it because I know you're good. I know you're faithful. I know you're always gonna lead me to places of flourishing and deeper dependence. And so I am the Lord's servant. It's a yes. I don't have to evaluate it. I don't have to check it out. I don't have to bring it before you know a council of elders to say, is this the wise thing to do? Because it came from wisdom. It came from the God who knows us and loves us beyond all things. And then she says, I'm the Lord's servant. And then I love this. She says, may your word to me be fulfilled, meaning I'm willing to wait. I know it's coming. I don't know how it's going to come, but may it be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. And then the story unfolds. If you know the story, Mary, she she is overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. The Son of God is put inside of her virgin womb. And months later, she goes and visits her cousin, Elizabeth, who is also pregnant, now six months pregnant, with baby John the Baptist. And as Mary comes into Elizabeth's home, baby John the Baptist, who is in utero, who is eventually going to be the forerunner for Jesus, he's going to be the guy going throughout all of Israel, proclaiming the Son of God, proclaiming that there is one coming, the Messiah, who is going to be the the propitiation for sins. He's gonna take the sins of humanity for those that would surrender and trust in him. And John the Baptist is proclaiming that. But before he ever proclaims that, there is a destiny on his life, even in utero. And so as the son of God in utero comes into the room in proximity to baby John the Baptist, the forerunner, baby John the Baptist, who is now filled with the Holy Spirit, can't explain that, baby John the Baptist just starts worshiping. He's a baby. He's jumping up and down in utero. He's singing Maverick City. He's like, I don't know what he's doing. Whatever song in his heart is coming out and he is going crazy because that's actually what happens when you and I get in proximity to the Son of God. When we have an encounter with God, the inevitable activity of our souls is extravagance back to him. And that really is the, the second theme, and I wish we had more time to unpack it, but, but let's just hit this. The, the second theme is, is that our waiting, and we're all waiting, but a godly kind of waiting with expectation, how this waiting, it moves us to an extravagance, a, a kind of worship that, that does not seem normative for those outside the kingdom. Again, we don't have time to unpack all of this, but if you go to the end of Luke chapter 1, what, what you're seeing is the light bulb going off for Mary. Mary has had a radical interruption in her life by an, an, by an angel. And the angel's like, I know you had plans. I know you had dreams. And they were awesome. And God saw those. And he, he loves that you're dreaming about your future. But God has better dreams, better plans for your life, Mary. And when Mary finally gets that, and she seems to get it at the end of Luke 1, the inevitable response for her of God knowing her name and having plans for her life is worship. In fact, at the end of Luke 1, she writes the first New Testament worship song. I mean, the whole Bible is filled with worship and adoration to God, but Luke records the very first Jesus worship song. It's the first song that has basically Jesus stamped on it. And I want to read to you just, I'm not going to sing it to you, but I, I want to read to you just part of her song. She says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. So mercy moved Mary to worship. Mercy, the mercy of God moved Mary to worship, not just mercy over her own life, certainly mercy had flowed into her own life, but her worship was a response because capital M mercy 
as in personal pronoun, mercy is a person. Mercy is now flowing into the storyline of all humanity. Let me say it this way. When I, when I began to pastor, I've been pastoring a church now for 20 years. And when, when we planted the church, both my, my wife Amy and I, we, we knew we wanted to be part of a church that, that was filled with extravagant worship. But extravagant worship is predicated on extravagant worshipers. And the counterintuitive nature of, of having a house like ours filled with extravagant worshipers is the way that you get that is not by pounding on the pulpit and reminding people of the commands to lift your hands. The way that we get extravagant worship is by first-hand experience with mercy. Let me say it a different way. When, when you and I have an experience, when, when there is a white-hot reality of the mercy of God, because we're broken, we're fractured, we all deserve judgment, we all deserve hell, we all deserve the absolute worst that God can give us. When we are aware and we come face to face with his mercy to say not guilty, and not just not guilty, but you are now sons and daughters of God. When that white hot mercy takes hold in our heart, it naturally, inevitably flows into worship in our mouths. Let me say it even a different way. The way that extravagant worship happens, it it never happens by by commanding behavior change or by reminding you of the rules and the commands because those things will not actually cause a dead heart to come to life. The only way a dead heart comes to life is by mercy, by the grace of God through the Son, Jesus, which is why I, I love Advent so much, because it's this, this over reminder that our God comes to us. He comes to us, his enemies. That's what the Bible would say. We are in enmity with God. We are the ones that put him on the cross. We are the ones that curse him with our lives, and yet he comes to us as Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so he leaves heaven, leaves comfort, becomes the first missionary knowing he's going to be crucified for it and he comes knowing that we need life meaning Jesus did not come to make you a better version of you he came to take dead people and make them alive people by mercy and if you're here today and you find yourself describing your life as dead purposeless void going through the motions, then mercy is available to you today that you might come alive. And that's really the invitation. In fact, I find regularly, I have conversations with people sitting in gatherings like this, that they're in their worst moments, often of their own doing, by the the way. We're our worst enemy. And in spaces like this, and during the worship portion, just crying their eyes out. And what they're experiencing is just the mercy of God. They can't explain it, they don't have words for it, but God's saying, I have more for you. I'm about to interrupt your life, and it's gonna be inconvenient, but the path I have you on, the story that I'm about to rewrite, it's going to be for your good, and it's gonna be the good of other people. And so that's the invitation. The invitation is mercy today. It's mercy for those that if you've never experienced mercy, the mercy of God, and it's for those of you that need a refresher course in the mercy of God. You think you get in by mercy, but you stay in because of your good works. No, it's mercy from beginning to end.